So Ty, in, in your practice, we know that there's also the Ipinevo trial, uh, the Checkmate 214 trial that's completed accrual. We're waiting for the readout. Um, we know that in other diseases, uh, PDL1 testing uh, can select in some patients identification of people that are likely to benefit. What, how do you approach that for kidney cancer patients? What Michael just suggested is hypothesis generating observations that hopefully large phase three trials will be able to address. Um, but at a practicing level, it's important for our, our, our listeners to understand where we are today in terms of PDL1 testing, whether it happens to be in their local laboratory or at a central lab. So how do you approach that? With regards to PDL1 testing, there's a lot of antibodies out there. There's some from DACO, some from uh, Ventana, and there's different cutoffs. And the cutoffs can vary from tumor type. So it can be very confusing to the practicing clinician when you order one of these tests, what to do with the test. At least in checkmates, uh, the checkmates that'll, for nivolumab, the PDL1 status, whether you use 1% or 5%, didn't seem to predict response. And I think the, the big take home message from, at least in kidney cancer, is that there are patients who are stratified as PDL1 negative yet still respond to immunotherapy. So I think it can make it a little bit challenging using this test to use as a predictive marker. And I think with the Jimmy Carter effect, as I like to explain it, you know, patients are coming more to me asking specifically for immunotherapy. And having a combination of nivolumab plus something that potentially could boost its activity, maybe at the molecular level, you're, doing, you're causing some more of this uh, neoantigen spreading where essentially as a tumor is lysed, some of these antigens are released and the local uh, dendritic cells pick up these antigens and then it causes a neoantigen spreading. So by using these combinations, you may be able to boost efficacy, but there could be a price to pay, as uh, Martin uh, alluded, with tolerability. So this has been an excellent uh, discussion. Uh, before we end, I'd like to ask each of the panelists for any additional insight regarding the treatment landscape, and I'll go through you individually. So Martin, 2017, where are we today, and where, we're, where are we going to be in five years? Uh, I think we've made tremendous progress over the last decade, and I think there has been a real uh, jump in pushing the boundary further over the last two years. I think there's really, uh, you know, uh, a, um, a whole new avenue of therapy uh, and also of um, technologies that are available to better understand the molecular underpinnings of all this that is now available to us. And I think it provides us with opportunity over the next years to, uh, uh, you know, to do more of that, to rationally combine medications, not just you know, because they're both available, uh, and to use the biology to understand them. I think the emotion trial that Michael described so eloquently really sets the stage for what is to happen in the future. Here we have the first randomized trial to now look at different strategies, and it shows us that it's not always one approach that is the right one, but that we can find ways to understand you know, who might be benefiting from one approach more than the other. Michael, your thoughts? Yeah, one thing I want to emphasize is we've studied nivolumab in the second line setting in patients who've progressed after VEGF receptor TKIs. And there's a lot of data to suggest that in that setting, there is an increased infiltration of myeloid derived suppressor cells that come in to help promote angiogenesis after you've. Um, essentially infarcted the tumor with VEGF inhibitors. And that may be not the best time to be using an immune therapy. And in that setting, it's still remarkable that we see a 25% response rate, 30, 40% of patients having tumor shrinkage. And at five, four and five years, there's 30 plus percent of patients who are alive. And we have precious little data about how these checkpoint inhibitors work in the frontline setting as either single agents or what combinations um, should be used. And it's possible in um, melanoma in the frontline setting um, as first therapy, immunotherapy works better than if you wait until after tumors have become resistant. And it's possible the same thing may be the case in kidney cancer. And therefore, I'm very anxious to see the results of the Checkmate 214 trial. I think we need to see some data for what nivolumab or pembrolizumab or atezolizumab does by itself in the frontline setting. We have a little bit in the 
uh, emotion trial, and if, you want, if your goal is to produce a CR, then a Tezo is your best option of those three options in uh, the uh, emotion study. And I think there are a tremendous number of other potential immune therapies that can target specific immunosuppressive cells in the tumor microenvironment that we're going to see in a lot of different cancers, whether it's inhibitors of IDO, inhibitors of uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cell function, inhibitors of other checkpoints. And I think I can envision in five years where immune therapy is the standard frontline therapy and the combination that someone gets will depend on some assay of their tumor microenvironment. Sandy, your thoughts? Um, I think the last decade has been f uh, for kidney cancer. We have had a lot of drugs, but it's mostly been palliative. You know, it's been disease prolonging. I'm hoping that the next decade really would bring on with uh, bringing immunotherapy upfront, really result in more complete responses where we can have finite therapy for patients and not have them have therapy for the rest of their lives. And Ty? Yeah, I, I think we've mentioned on the panel several times that you know, loss of VHL is a common event. And it's very frustrating because when you look at VHL loss, there's no relationship to whether patients respond to VEGF therapy. I think one of the things that is emerging both from Bill Kalin's lab as well as Jim Bruguerolos's lab are these HIF2 antagonists or hypoxia-induced factors. Basically, this is downstream of VHL. And when I was going through school, it was considered to be undruggable. Now they have HIF2 antagonists that have activity in preclinical models. It's already started some of the clinical trials as well, and it's a different mechanism from what we have available now. And I think something that's something like that that's outside the current mechanisms that we have is something worth watching. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this discussion helpful and informative.